Listen. What do you hear? It's the city. Sounds of complex motion. Vibrations. Piercing. Annoying and distressing. A peaceful nap in New York City or Chicago is sometimes never experienced for the constant banging on the street below or the clinging of jackhammers pounding away at the once solid concrete. Sounds and images together soft in the scene, but take out the pictures and the meaning of what you hear is different, disturbing, anxious. You await the return of the images to come back to your comfort zone. Why do sounds make us feel this way? Does our subconscious take note of what's wrong with what we hear? What's the motive behind these compound noises? Progress. It's how we get where we are today. Without it, life would not be easy. But does progress actually make it easy for us? Perhaps it's easy in the manner of daily routines and completing tasks such as calculating, flying, driving, and producing. Without progress, we would probably never prosper. Technology would suffer. Life would be complicated. Is this true? Would life actually be complicated without advancement? Or is it more true that with continued development toward the future, we're making daily tasks more complicated? Development, advancement, growth, and progress. These terms are commonplace in our world today. To move forward for the purpose of progress, we believe that these are vital. But the change we have implemented is a change that is detrimental to our existence and that of nature. On the nearby horizon lies the fact that what we do for purpose of progress shifts the balance toward benefiting us and leaving nature to figure out how to adapt to our needs. If human influence on the natural environment continues, our children will have no other reason but to rename the era the Anthropocene. Although we don't actually see them saying it, their words are a harsh and disturbing sound that reverberates within our minds. With the rising sun in the east, humans begin their daily hustle and bustle tasks, rushing to work, completing reports, analyzing future profits, building for tomorrow. But what's behind this daily blur that darkens the future of our planet? These images are humanity. We are these images. Future historians and anthropologists a thousand years from now will easily identify these objects as humanity because they are the methods that modified Earth. Anthropogenic is a term that is creeping more and more in the news and academic journal articles. Students and people alike, when asked what this term means, answer with puzzled expressions. It refers to the influence that humans have on the natural world, influences that can have positive or negative effects. Uh, anything that's, uh, that's human influence would be anthropogenic. Anything that, that, that people, humans, touch that uh, affect uh, the world around us an anthropogenic effect on the weather, anthropogenic effect on the land. So, so human-induced changes would be anthropogenic changes. To understand the significance of our influence, explore the connections that are similar to a domino effect. As a family migrates into a virgin, natural landscape that will provide a perfect location for a home, they change the land by clearing trees and relocating soil to build. Just a few steps away, the land is turned into a garden to supply food for the new residents. Then, several people follow in to settle in the same area. When a series of dwellings are built, they require utilities to function and more land to grow food. Therefore, electricity and plumbing are installed and land turned into fields. To supply utilities for the growing neighborhood, power and water plants are constructed. When finished, the utility plants require more earthly resources to provide for the demand. Coal is chiseled out to fuel the furnaces that turn pumped water into steam to run the turbines to create electricity. Water for consumption is pumped in, purified, treated, and polished. Over time, the neighborhood expands into a city. More electricity and water is needed to supply the demand. Therefore, more land is acquired to supply the fuel needed to turn the turbines. More water is needed for steam and supply the growing city. Consequently, dams are constructed to increase the storage of water. 
Food is also required to supply the expanding city. Land is modified to make it more suitable for growing crops. As the city continues to expand, the land for growing crops dwindles. The result is to continue to modify the land for agriculture just outside the city. As the years turn into decades, the scenario is similar to playing leapfrog. Cities take the land to provide for the population, and farmers go beyond the city to provide the population food. Eventually, more power and water plants grow in numbers to support the developing city. Complicating matters, conveniences such as stores, markets, and outlets are built to provide the growing city with their necessities. This increases the rate of population growth and land required to sustain growth. You may be wondering what's the problem with this if it demonstrates success and prosperity. You may be right. Nevertheless, the domino effect is complex. All that has been discussed is the modification of land to supply the demand of an expanding city. But consider the byproducts of this expansion. At any time you convert uh, land, soil, and you, you change it to concrete and asphalt, you, you, you're certainly changing the way the, 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 the surface of the planet absorbs sunlight or, or the albedo. When, when we begin to alter the, the amount of sunlight that's absorbed by, by the continents, and, and, and we do it with the oceans, but n not, not as easily seen as on the continent. So if we expand into farmland, we're, we're, we're changing not only the albedo, but, but uh, evapotranspiration. We're changing that as well. And, and you know, how far can we go with that? How, how far can we go eating up wonderfully productive farmland like we have in, in a good part of the United States, at least the Midwest, the breadbasket of the world? How far can we go and, and eating up acreage that, that, we, that we grow food with? Every acre we expand takes away a piece of nature. It takes away the natural air, the virgin land, the natural habitats that wildlife needs to survive. It's an invasion on nature, uncontrolled, simply for the purpose of progress. But there are differences. The differences are based on location. Cities established hundreds of years ago tend not to expand outwardly due to their historical expansion into other cities or the limits forced by the landscape. Therefore, the continued expansion of these established cities is upward. Towering skyscrapers provide housing for residents and offices for businesses. But the cities that are not bound by natural limits continue to expand outwardly due to the vast resource just outside the city limits. In addition to the issue is the psychology of the human mind. Each of us has a certain buffer zone. Some zones of comfort are large and others small. Those who live in large cities around the world tend to have small buffer zones, which is evident by the way they reside in dwellings. People who have large buffer zones live in landscapes that are wide and open. Taiwan is an Asian island off the coast of China. The island is approximately the size of Indiana. 23.2 million people live on this island. It's crowded. Future outward expansion is not possible. So how do they house future generations? The answer is to build upward, which has been traditionally done in the past. The Taiwanese typically have a small buffer zone that allows them to tolerate the crowded population and build upward. Perhaps this is the answer for cities on vast amounts of land. Instead of expanding the city limits into the natural environment as well as decrease the agricultural lands, cities should begin building upward. The answer is simple, but the comfort zones of the residents are not that easy to shrink. People enjoy their lawns and flower gardens. Suburbanites want to allow their dogs to run free in their backyards. Children play in sandboxes. Privacy fences are raised to keep neighbors from prying. How do we convince people to change? Do people realize what the future would be if we continue to expand unrestricted into nature's realm? Uh, seniors that are about to, uh, to go into the world or go on to, to advanced degrees, we find that, uh, that a, a substantial portion are not aware of, of things like the effects of global climate change. What do they do? So I, it, it's, it's important that we, we uh, do our job and, and uh, 
sort of getting the word out. I, I, I think it's I, if one tunes in, one reads the newspaper and looks at the, looks at the news and, and watches and listens, it's becoming pretty much uh, aware. It, 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 it's a story that's unfolding in front of us, and I, I think uh, more and more are becoming aware. But still, but still, uh, we need to make that happen even more because the more collectively we learn about the results of our development, the negative effects, maybe the faster we'll respond in trying to mitigate those effects. When cities invade the agricultural lands, less food is produced to feed the people. When land for growing crops shrinks, farmers are forced to modify it to increase yields on a smaller plot. In order to increase the yields, they must use fertilizers. Fertilizers not only modify the immediate area, but also modify areas thousands of miles away. When a farmer applies fertilizer on his crops, it increases the abundance of food. When it rains, the fertilizer is eventually carried to a nearby stream. One stream dumps its water into a small river, which dumps into another river, which dumps into a larger river, until it ends up in the ocean. The southern coast of the United States along the Gulf of Mexico is considered the highest polluted water in the world due to agriculture. Nitrogen is the dominant chemical in fertilizers. When nitrogen ends up in the Gulf Coast area, the bacteria population increases. The effects cause fish and native water plants to die due to the lack of oxygen in the water. More importantly, the beaches where people swim for pleasure become vacant due to the fear of flourishing diseases. Farmers are not to blame. It's the population as a whole. Increased population centers demand more from smaller fields. Sure, there's plenty of land, but there's a risk that can affect the future, the degradation of the land. And there's, there's, there's a break point. And there's a break point as to how productive an acre can become. Can you, can you get 500 bushels of corn out of an acre? I doubt it. I don't think so. Or, or soybeans. There's a point you say, you say well, how, we, we can just be more productive with the acreage that we have. But there's a limit. And, and the, more, the more acreage that we convert to urbanization, to urban uses, uh, the less we'll have to grow. And the more we change not only the, the albedo of, of, our, of our surfaces, but um, evapotranspiration as well, which affects the atmosphere. Too much fertilizing, soil compaction, and overgrazing can have adverse effects for civilization. Fertilizing could possibly make the soil sterile. Crop yields would diminish, as would the food supply. Soil compaction creates a powder that limits water absorption. During heavy rain events, the water would run off, taking the important ingredient with it, topsoil. Increased runoff increases the risk of devastating floods. The demand to increase beef and pork production causes overgrazing that can result in desertification, a change in the land that limits its ability to repair itself. The atmosphere is another vital component in the function of the Earth's system. It's a filter from the powerful rays of the sun, a blanket that keeps us warm at night and cool during the day. It contains the important ingredients of life. It feeds the world. It refreshes us. Maybe we don't realize how important it is to us because we only acknowledge that it produces fascinating storms and picturesque sunsets and clouds. The air is choking from our advancements. The use of electricity, refining oil, manufacturing products, and driving to and from work is creating a major change in the function of the atmosphere. In the 1920s, Thomas Midgley Jr. developed chlorofluorocarbons. The purpose was to find a non-volatile compound that would be used as a refrigerant and propellant. Throughout much of the 20th century, this compound was manufactured and used. In the 1970s, scientists concluded that CFCs were having harmful effects on the ozone layer that protects life from the damaging ultraviolet rays of the sun. Today, most of the world no longer manufactures CFCs, but the damage has already been done. It will be decades before ozone levels will return to normal. Deforestation in South America is harming the environment as well. Trees are cut and burned, increasing airborne particulates. 
the forest cover that once provided dwellings for wildlife and protection from the sun is smaller. The greenhouse gas carbon dioxide increases slowly when the absorber is removed. Uh, maybe about 8,000 years ago when, when humans started uh, farming you know, primitively and uh, beginning to turn the earth, cut, cut trees down, by doing that, deforestation begins to uh, alter the amount of CO2. Cut down a tree, and you're removing a unit that removes CO2 from the atmosphere. And then if you burn it or let it rot, it will add CO2. So it's a double hit. So in a, in a very rudimentary way, that started maybe eight, eight, seven, 8,000 years ago, after the last ice age ended, and humans were beginning to till the soil. But, but in a much more rapid way, in the last uh, 150 years since the Industrial Revolution, when, when we've accelerated the increase in carbon dioxide by increased uh, uh, deforestation, of course, burning of fossil fuels in a big way. Fossil fuels we use to supply electricity and run our vehicles further increases air pollution, resulting in an increase in the number of hot, stifling days and smog that chokes the residents of a town low in a valley. Denora, Pennsylvania is situated approximately 20 miles to the south of Pittsburgh in a low valley surrounded by rolling hills. A bustling city produced steel, coal, and agriculture. Between October 26th and October 31st, 1948, 68 people died from industry-produced smog. The cause was a temperature inversion where warmer temperatures above the valley created a lid over the cooler valley, trapping high levels of pollutants. In later decades, hundreds of people would live out their lives with disabling health issues such as lung cancer and heart disease. If you look at the skyline of a large city, you might see a brownish layer hovering just above the towering buildings. This layer is smog produced by traffic and the increase in industry. It traps heat and lowers the purity of air we breathe in. It's a disgusting sight created by our need to progress. What will the future hold if we don't acknowledge our mistakes and make the effort to change our ways? What will it take? A disaster? The death of a loved one who suffered from the harmful effects of smog? What will your grandchildren say to their children when food costs five times what it does today because we expanded beyond the limits? How will they cope? If you're thinking, what can I do? Well, the answer is simple. I would point to the, this wonderful country of ours and the fact that we have the right to vote. One person, one vote. When you're of age, you can vote. And so if one took the tack that, well, my vote doesn't mean anything, well, then how does how does a president get elected? How's a, how does a member of Congress get elected? They get elected by lot, lots of people going to the polls with their single vote. And collectively, they make a difference in person A getting elected to person B. If you don't vote, you don't have a say. Yes, it's one voice, but it's, it's, a, it's a collective of millions and on the planet billions of voices that, that have to be heard in order to get to a, in order to go in a direction, you've, you've got to, when you build a building, and if you build it out of bricks, one little brick at a time makes the building go up. So it's one effort at a time, one individual at a time that makes changes occur, positively or negatively. Acknowledging and understanding the influence we have on the natural world will promote a global decision to protect what we have. Plundering our natural resources will only return to force us to find more complicated methods of patching up what we did. Are we willing to accept those consequences and restrictions? The overusage of our resources will eventually cause us to struggle unless we do something about it now. Well, first of all, they have to be aware. Every human has to be aware of his or her, uh, his or her effect on the planet. Awareness is number one. Education. You've you've got to know when when you're when you're when you're brushing your teeth and the water is running and running and running and maybe a couple of gallons run through. You've got to be aware of the fact that that it's a limited resource. 
we've got to get away from the idea that that there's, there's always more of everything. We go to we go to a grocery store and there's always more of everything, at least in this country. But that's not always the case. At some point, we're going to run out. We have a we have a beautiful blue green globe here called planet Earth. It's got it's got limitations on its resources. We can't just keep pummeling and and pulling out uh, the resources that we utilize without realizing they're limited. And so awareness is number one. We've got to know that it's limited. If you have time for a quick story, I, I, a Russian immigrant uh, came, in New York City came to visit uh, family members that were, had been living here for a while. This was in New York City, in Brooklyn, and and uh, they took a, they took the the their their, uh, their family member that was uh, never been to the United States before took him into a into a supermarket, and the visiting uh, Russian individual asked. Uh, what what can we buy here? And and their relatives said, well, you can buy anything you want. Well, how much can we buy? As much as you want, as long as we pay for it. And 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 the visiting Russian cried because uh, you know that was something that uh, unheard of in the old Soviet Union and, and to a lesser degree in Russia today. But what we take for granted is not is not available in in a good part of the rest of the world. Limited resources. We've got to know that they're limited, and we've got to take steps to manage the resources in an intelligent way so that they're sustainable into the future. Will we be comforted by the duet of pictures and sounds of nature's realm in its splendor, or will we only hear the echoes of our future children deciding on the official label of our mistakes as the Anthropocene era? The, the, the biggest enemy to positive change is apathy, simply not caring, not becoming involved. Being apathetic gets nothing done, whether it's for voting, whether it's for sustaining a resource. Apathy will get us absolutely nowhere towards towards being better, better uh, managers of our planet. And uh, so, we must not be apathetic. We must get involved individually, collectively, if we want to make this planet continue to be the beautiful place that it is. Mm -hmm. That's it. To learn more about this program and take a look behind the scenes, visit our website at tempestusproductions.com.
Listen. What do you hear? It's the city. Sounds of complex motion. Vibrations. Piercing. Annoying and distressing. A peaceful nap in New York City or Chicago is sometimes never ex With the rising sun in the east, humans begin their daily hustle and bustle tasks. Rushing to work, completing reports, analyzing future profits, building for tomorrow. But what's behind this daily blur that darkens the future of our planet? These images are humanity. We are these images. Future historians and anthropologists a thousand years from now will easily identify these objects as humanity because they are the methods that modified Earth. These are vital. But the change we have implemented is a change that is detrimental to our existence and that of nature. On the nearby horizon lies the fact that what we do for purpose of progress shifts the balance toward benefiting us and leaving nature to figure out how to adapt to our needs. If human influence on the natural environment continues, our children will have no other reason but to rename the era the Anthropocene. Although we don't actually see them saying it, their words are a harsh and disturbing sound that reverberates within our minds. Make it easy for us. Perhaps it's easy in the manner of daily routines and completing tasks such as calculating flying, driving, and producing, without progress, we would probably never prosper. Technology would suffer. Life would be complicated. Is this true? Would life actually be complicated without advancement? Or is it more true that with continued development toward the future, we're making daily tasks more complicated? Development, advancement, growth, and progress. These terms are commonplace in our world today. To move forward for the purpose of progress, we believe that the experience for the constant banging on the street below or the clanging of jackhammers pounding away at the once solid concrete. Sounds and images together soft in the scene, but take out the pictures and the meaning of what you hear is different, disturbing, anxious. You await the return of the images to come back to your comfort zone. Why do sounds make us feel this way? Does our subconscious take note of what's wrong with what we hear? What's the motive behind these compound noises? Progress. It's how we get where we are today. Without it, life would not be easy. But does progress actually